Okay, and then I'm also Check going out. to begin the recording. Okay, and then Noelle, I'm going to um, spotlight you. And then I, I'm going to, I'm now letting everybody in. How's that? Okay. Let me know when um, I can start. Uh, I know we have to wait for folks to join. I still can't, uh, I still can't hear. Richard, are you able to join Maybe through your I can um, use my phone here? Yeah. I'll, I'll call Richard. Yep. Okay. Welcome, everyone. We're just getting started here, letting everybody in. We'll begin shortly. Hello. Hello. Yeah. We'll begin shortly. Please mute yourself. Hi, I'm John Miller. Hi, John. I'm. Noelle, go ahead and unmute yourself. I, I've muted everybody else while we're getting going here. And I think you okay. can begin when you're ready. Okay, so start anytime now? Yep. Okay, well, let's do this. Aloha and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today as we discuss vertical agriculture technology, an important new way of farming. My name is Noelle Marin. I'm a board member of Think Big, which stands for uh, Think Big Island Green. Uh, we are a new Hawaii Island nonprofit working to improve our sustainability, equity, and resilience. We focus on renewable energy, waste management, parks and trails, education, and agriculture. We are hosting today's webinar to begin a public discussion on the merits of vertical farming for the Big Island and Hawaii in general. I'm joined today by fellow board members, starting with Tam Hunt, lead organizer for our event today. Tam is a, an attorney and author he has extensive experience in renewable energy policy. He's also a board member for the Hawaii EV Association. We also have board member Jeanette Gura, a forester who is a, uh, also the director of the Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, or WUCAN. That's a, that's a mouthful there. A, uh, a Kona-based international organization working on gender equity and agriculture. Jeanette is establishing an agriculture innovation hub for women farmers on the Hamakua coast. And last but not least, we have board member Heather Kimball. Heather is Hawaii County Council member for District 1. She has a long a background in climate policy and consulting. She's also working with a lo local ag hui, looking at opportunities for the Hamakua coast. Heather is our host for today. And with this, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Heather? Thank you, Noelle. Noelle, can you go ahead and spotlight me? You're the host now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Noelle, for the introduction. My name is Heather Kimball, and I am the Hawaii County Council member for District 1, which is on the Hamakua Coast. It spans from the Wailuku River all the way up to um, Waimea, and um, all the way out to YPO Valley. I'm excited to host today's webinar and begin a much needed conversation about food security, local agriculture, imported food, how that all impacts the climate picture and how we can improve the quality of food in here, here in Hawaii. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll be moderating a Q&A session later today. And um, initially we're gonna begin with a, a panelist portion uh, we have several speakers. It's going to take about 45 minutes, but please stay along on um, if you have questions for, for later in today's presentation. We will be wrapping up by 1230. So let me go ahead and begin by introducing our panelists. Representative Nicole Lowen is a resident of Kailua Kona and has been serving as a state representative for the Big Island since 2020, 2012. She is chair of the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee and has sponsored and passed a number of bills helping to improve Hawaii's environment and quality of life. Thank you for being here, Noelle, Nicole. Aloha, thank you. Our next um, presenter today is Blair Richards with Sensei Ag. Um, Blair entered the ag world as a seasonal employee for Charlie's Produce while studying at Washington State. Blair eventually became general manager of Rogue Co., a division of Charlie's that specializes in producing 
providing goods and services to Alaska. Upon relocating to Hawaii, after working for Dr. Otani Produce, or sorry, D. Otani Produce, um, a family-run distribution company, Blair joined Sensei, where he's currently Director of Sales and Business Development for Hawaii. Thank you, Blair, for joining us today. Our next guest is uh, Richard Ha. Many of you know him. Uh, Richard is a U.S. Army veteran and a 40-year commercial banana and hydroponic tomato farmer. He is also founder and president of Sustainable Energy Hawaii, a member of the Social Science Association, and serves on various boards and commissions around the state, uh, in our county and state. Um, thank you, Richard, for being here. It's, it's nice to have you, nice to see you. And finally, let's welcome Kerry Kakazu, a PhD. He is the owner and president of Metro Grow Hawaii, the first vertical farm in the state of Hawaii founded in 2014. Metro Grow Hawaii grows lettuce, microgreens, other leafy greens for local restaurants and gourmet markets. It's located in Kaka'ako on Oahu, and the farm participates in the Honolulu Farmers Market with its mix of premium produce and value-added products. Products. Thank you so much, Carrie, for being here with us today. All right, we will begin our conversation. Let's dive right in. Um, we're going to invite Carrie from MetroGo to kick us off. Carrie, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, I guess I have some slides. Um, Tam, or go, am I going to control it, or who are you? Yeah, go ahead, correct, Carrie, from your side. Okay. Okay, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Noel, can you make um, Carrie the host? Or it might take Heather doing that. Um, Noel, just oh, go ahead and. Okay, I see. I'm the host now. Okay, great. Okay. Does everybody see that uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, as um, Heather mentioned, uh, my name is Kerry Kakazu. I'm the oh, okay. president oh, of perfect. Thank you. Okay, bye. Uh, Metro Grow Hawaii, we're the first vertical farm in Hawaii. Uh, as uh, she mentioned, that we started selling in 2014. We actually started uh, uh, building our operation in 2013. Here. And um, well, um, started Everyone, our please first commercial yourself. sales in 2014. Okay. So, uh, as a topic today is a lot about um, our food self-sufficiency. I'll just I'll start with this slide. As we all know, you know, one of the big problems we have here in Hawaii, most of our food is imported. Uh, statistics are kind of uh, all over the place, but generally around 85% of our uh, produce oh, is good. imported. Uh, the other thing that, uh, you know, despite what everybody seems to think from, at least from outside Hawaii, uh, oh, you have a great climate and you know wonderful growing conditions, but it is really challenging to grow uh, produce traditionally in Hawaii. Uh, we have limited land area. Um, we seem to be having more and more extreme weather events recently. Uh, fresh water supply is something we don't always hear about, but I, I think it's going to be a big issue moving forward. Uh, pest pressure, another one you know people kind of overlook, but because of our ideal growing conditions. Uh, we also have ideal conditions for pests. Um, chemical and biological contamination continues to be a concern. Uh, here on Oahu, at least, uh, its uh, infrastructure for agriculture is really underdeveloped. Uh, so it's a big issue moving forward. And then because we are on an island of cost of supplies and equipment, it's always a big challenge uh, here compared to many, many other locations. So one possible solution uh, we, we are proposing is vertical farming, our topic for today. And just for those of you who may not be familiar, vertical farming is the cultivation of plants in a protected structure. So it could be a, a warehouse as we see here. This is uh, Aero Farms, probably one of the largest vertical farms in the country. And um, greenhouses are technically also an example of protected agriculture, or, uh, but Usually greenhouses are more on a single layer, so maybe not quite vertical. 
Uh, but in a typical vertical farm, we grow multiple levels at very high density, and it's usually hydroponically, so without soil. Uh, the big advantage of doing this indoors is that we can control the environment of the growing operation. And another phrase you may hear in association with vertical farming is controlled environment agriculture. So it's a whole uh, sort of subset or science uh, a field of study for growing things. So we can uh, control all the environment uh, for optimal plant growth. Uh, so usually that means going, it's going to be uh, supplemental lighting, some totally 100% electric lighting, some a combination of both. Uh, we also have control over the temperature and humidity of the growing environment, uh, dehumidifiers, air conditioning, uh, and then we can also deliver precise amounts of nutrient and water. So uh, again, everything is kind of contained within the environment. So there's really no runoff. Uh, usually most of these operations are recirculating water and nutrients so we can control uh, that input and output also. Okay. What are some of the advantages of this type of farming? Uh, first of all, of course, we can get a high yield in a small amount of space. As you saw in that arrow farm example, uh, they go up, you know, maybe about, uh, I've seen 12, 14 racks high in a giant warehouse. So obviously you're gonna get a lot more growing uh, capacity in a small amount of space. Uh, the other thing that's an advantage is it's weather independent. We don't uh, have to worry too much about storms and uh, hopefully not too much about tornadoes, depending on how good our building is. Uh, but we're not uh, climate uh, sensitive. And with this control and uh, weather independence, usually most vertical farms have very consistent production. So you're, it's um, pretty predictable that, okay, we're gonna have this temperature and this amount of water and this temp um, amount of light. So we can predict pretty accurately that we'll get this kind of yield. Now it's still a biological system. So there's always un some unpredictability, but a lot more uh, probably predictable than a um, outdoor farm. Uh, another big one I think is a real good advantage for vertical farming is very much less water consumption. And our own data and most uh, farmers uh, that are doing vertical farming say somewhere around 90% uh, less water consumption than a traditional farm. So that's a tremendous amount of savings. And again, as we um, are always worried about fresh water here in Hawaii, I think that's gonna be a big factor going forward. Uh, our case and in most vertical farms cases, we don't use any pesticides. So there's that uh, less contamination and environmental damage. Um, we can again, contain the water and the nutrients. So we don't have the agricultural runoff uh, that you would have in an outdoor situation. And the big one on, on a lot of our customers' minds uh, is that we don't have contamination from uh, rat lungworm um, and other kinds of uh, that kind of contamination. Okay. So here's our farm, uh, our, our sort of attempt at taking this uh, vertical farming idea and implementing it here in Hawaii. So we're located in this uh, warehouse that you see on the top picture. It's uh, right in the middle of Kakako on Kauai House Street. And uh, we're actually on the first floor of this two-story building. And uh, like I said, we've been doing commercial sales since 2014. We actually uh, just moved into this building about a year and a half ago. And we started off in an 800 square foot um, second floor uh, property actually in Kakaako. And so when we started looking for a larger space, uh, my first thing was I'm never gonna be on the second floor again. Uh, that was a, quite a challenge. Okay. Uh, we utilize um, aeroponic and hydroponic growing systems uh, for our uh, um, uh, our produce and uh, aeroponics for those of you who may not be familiar is uh, instead of having the plants just sit in water all the time we actually spray the roots with um, a mist of nutrients and water as you can see in the lower picture we have multi-level growing systems everything's on racks and uh, in the case of our new operation they're on mobile racks so we can actually move things around and really maximize the space uh, the operation, the plants all grow under a very energy efficient LED lighting, uh, which I think was really sort of the big technological advance that uh, made this even be, could be considered for um, growing plants economically. 
Uh, previously, you know, we would see thousand watt uh, metal halide or sodium pressure lamps, and uh, you know that electricity cost and the cooling cost would just be too tremendous. So uh, LEDs and their efficiency really helped open up the idea that we could do this economically. Uh, we also have a pretty sophisticated and energy efficient uh, HVAC system that helps us maintain the temperatures at a pretty uh, cool level for most of our crops that prefer that temperature. So what do we grow? Um, our products, as we mentioned, we uh, do this uh, Salanova lettuce, which is a sort of smaller variety, but really designed to be good for a compact, uh, very pretty and high quality leaves, very little core, so very little waste. Uh, so it's really a good product for restaurants. Uh, we also do a lot of microgreens. You can see here, I think that's our cilantro um, and also some baby greens. And then we do pea and corn shoots, as you can see here. And then our probably most unique crop right now is this ice plant down at the bottom right. Uh, it's actually um, a edible version of that brown cover you might see on golf courses. It's a succulent. It actually absorbs salt from the environment and keeps on growing. So um, we've adapted that for our hydroponic systems and it gives it a real nice salty and uh, kind of crunchy taste. So what are the advantages? Uh, we mentioned some of the advantages of vertical farming. Uh, what do we think our advantages are as um, the first vertical farm in Hawaii? Uh, we've had now seven years of experience researching and growing and delivering these products. So we have a pretty good idea of what's involved and um, you know, what things are good, what things are not so good. Um, I think our other big advantage is that we can do unique items. So you know, rather than competing with our traditional farms and other methods, uh, we're trying to grow that stuff that maybe is not easily available because it's too hot or is, you know, like for our ice plant, for example, uh, you can't really put salt on your fields. So since it's hydroponic, we can easily add uh, salt to our plants. So that's kind of a niche we're in right now is to do the really unique things. And uh, that's why it appeals a lot to uh, restaurants and chefs. The other thing nice is that we're kind of small and modular, so we can do pretty rapid new product development. And so if a chef says, oh, gee, I'm interested in getting this crop, uh, we can get to it and sort of modify some of our growing systems to experiment with these new things. Uh, we're right in the middle of Kaka'ako, as I mentioned, so we get uh, really good access to our restaurants and markets and consumers. One of the other big advantages you hear about vertical farming is you can put it almost anywhere. So you can locate your growing very close to the end user. So really cut down on transportation costs. Um, and it you know, works really to our advantage. Chefs call up all the time, Gee, can I get this? You know, we were in the North Shore or some fairly outside of Honolulu location. Uh, it would be tough to get things to the chefs really quickly. Uh, the other thing that we're really focused on is to try and be as sustainable as possible. So, you know, energy is a big cost here. So we have a photovoltaic system uh, in our operation that uh, really cuts down on our electricity use. Uh, we're water recycling. Uh, we even have a, a special filter to take our air conditioning uh, wastewater and filter it to be able to reuse it um, on our operation. Uh, we're trying to use all kinds of safe sanitizing agents from ozonated water uh, to citric acid base. So we reduce chlorine and quaternary ammoniums and all those other uh, fairly toxic chemicals. Uh, we've Im implemented a container reuse program for our microgreens. So customers can bring back the containers, we'll sterilize them and then reuse them. And then knowing this audience, I have to mention, I do have an electric car that I deliver my produce in. Uh, it's just my own personal car, but you know, again, it's at least a step in the right direction. Okay, so what are the obstacles for us uh, right now in our production? Uh, high production costs, rent, energy, capital expenditures, uh, maintenance costs. Uh, so it's a, still, I think, at our size and what we're doing is still a more expensive way of growing. And it um, probably will be until you get to a certain scale and are able to reduce these things. Rent's actually our biggest cost. So I'm always saying, you know, somebody would just give me a building. Um, I think we'd be okay. So uh, that's a hard proposition. 
like any other business, uh, labor is a big expense. Um, my own feeling, I haven't ever run a traditional farm. I think we're actually probably a little bit less labor intensive than a traditional farm. So maybe it's a, uh, some of it, what of an advantage for us. And right now for vertical farms, it's a limited crop selection is a big thing. Um, it's really designed and, and focused on leafy greens and smaller plants with shorter life uh, uh, crop cycles. Things like fruiting plants, um, uh, flowering plants, larger plants, obviously would be challenging to grow economically. I mean, technically you could grow anything, but uh, economically it's kind of tough to do things like uh, large vine tomatoes, uh, big fruiting crops. You can't obviously do trees, uh, you can't do wheat or corn. So there's some limitation right now as to what we can produce. Okay. So how are we gonna overcome uh, some of these challenges? Uh, it's really kind of a simple equation. We can increase production, reduce expenses. So that's sort of our two uh, attacks right now. So we're always looking at how can we get the higher density? How can we increase yield? Uh, how can we reduce the crop cycle time? So just get more produce in the same amount of space. And on the expense side, with expense side which I think is where we can get some quicker and really bigger returns is, um, you know, things like using renewable energy, which we're already doing somewhat, uh, use more energy efficient equipment. Uh, most vertical farms are really pushing the use of more automation to cut down on labor uh, cost. And of course, always looking at how can we reuse and recycle what were our inputs so we can reduce uh, that expense. Okay, so what uh, do we think is our future and what we're trying to do moving forward? As I mentioned, 2,000 square feet, it's good size, but we're still a pretty small operation. And our niche, we realize, is restaurants, sort of high-end consumer products, value-added products. But we really are uh, have an eye on how can we contribute to the food uh, supply in Hawaii. So how can we apply this to commodity crop production? And I'm pretty, uh, I think, convinced that we do have to modify our system somewhat to really reduce those expenses or increase the yields in order to do this economically. And so we're working again on continued tuning of the growing environment. How can we cool more efficiently um, using crops that are now maybe bred specifically for vertical farms. A lot of research and companies are coming up that are doing that. Uh, we, we haven't implemented yet, which a lot of uh, farmers can do is to actually add more CO2 to the growing environment so the plants can grow faster. So those are on the production side. On the expense side, like I said, space and energy are sort of the low hanging fruit that we can address right away to try and reduce our expenses. And again, you know, for what we're doing now, kaka'ako is great. But again, if we're doing more commodity food crops where maybe producing a, a big amount that will be transported, not too far, but somewhere, uh, maybe you know, looking for an abandoned building that can't be used for something else. Uh, rail uh, here on Oahu anyway, uh, possibly along the rail line where maybe a uh, property can't be used for something else. Okay. Uh, more renewable energy uh, and things that I'm really looking at right now is how can we utilize sunlight? We're totally LED lighted now, but I'm trying to think that we must be able to bring in, since we have so much sunlight here, uh, although we are using it for PV, how can we get it into our uh, structure efficiently and utilize some of that sunlight to reduce our electric electrical costs. And then again, uh, cooling strategies. Uh, some plant or some growers in tropical climates actually use um, uh, air, uh, cool water for their roots. And uh, that way cool instead of cooling the whole area. Okay. So I think, you know, in conclusion, we really need to look at some of these alternative agriculture models to increase our self-sufficiency. Uh, we're not looking to replace any kind of traditional farming, but we just want to add to it. And uh, I think, again, Hawaii people are now seeing more um, uh, desire for local products. Pandemic has shown us uh, we really need to have more local produce available. Um, now, again, we have this uh, farm to school program and the state just signed the law to say we need to grow more and produce or purchase more local produce. So I think vertical farming is ideal for institutional sales where you can have a predictable supply. 
And then, you know, the other advantage is that we're going to reserve some of our prime agricultural land for crops that we can't do a vertical farm. So again, thank you all for learning about us. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And here's some contact information at the bottom. Thank you so much, Carrie. And if you could pass the host back to me, Heather Kimball, that'd be great. Okay. And then we will go to our next speaker once we've dealt with this logistics. Uh, Blair, did you have slides as well? Yes, I have a presentation I can share. Okay. And let me just get you spotlighted and we'll be ready to go. All right, Blair, you're up, take it away. Thank you. Well, first, I want to thank Carrie for going first and uh, you know participating in this. I actually had the the chance to tour Carrie's facility. I think it's about four weeks ago now. Um, so, uh, just uh, uh, he's doing great work down there at Metro Grow, and uh, really appreciate him sharing and being being a resource for us all to to learn from. So, so thank you, Carrie. Um, oops. Okay, stop sharing. There we go, we're back into presentation mode. Um, so I'm Blair Richards. I'm currently the director of um, sales and business development for Sensei Ag. Um, and I, I am grateful for the opportunity to engage with you guys and share a little bit about Sensei Ag today. So, uh, here is a little outline of my presentation. So, I kind of want to start by introducing you guys to like the, the story of, of why Sensei exists and kind of the history of Sensei Ag. And then we'll go into talking about um, the people that make up Sensei, some of our products, some of our key partnerships, um, areas we look for growth, and uh, some of our commitments. So first, a little bit about our history and, and why we're here. Um, so Sensei was kind of founded through tragedy. Um, and the tragedy brought together um, Dr. David Agus and, uh, and Larry Ellison um, with the mission to improve health and well-being through, throughout, through data using technology and scientific research. Um, so they, they founded Sensei Ag um, on the island of Lanai. Um, and with the leadership of uh, Mr. Ellison and Dr. Agus, you know, we look, we look to have them guide us uh, help us in design, develop, and deploy cutting edge agricultural technologies to build a better, more stable food supply capable of feeding our entire world nutritionally relevant, delicious, and affordable meals. So really it's quite in a, a grand vision that they are trying to solve here um, in, in the food security of, of the world. Um, then we'll go to our leader. Uh, our current leader of Sensei Ag is Sonia Lowe who um, she is a, you know, identifies as a farmer, uh, a chef and an investor. Um, she is the only woman to serve as a CEO of a major vertical farming company. Um, Sonia is currently living on the island of Lanai and you know, enculturating herself to, to Lanai and, and Hawaii. Um, I think this is a, a great quote from, from Sonia kind of identifying her commitment and, and Sensei's uh, place in, in agricultural technology. Um, at Sensei Ag, we see the true potential of indoor farming. With the capabilities and guidance of our founders, we are integrating and deploying the world's best data in plant science, taste, texture, and nutrition, along with the most cutting edge technologies to create the ubiquitous, affordable, and nutritionally relevant indoor farm of the future. So, I mean, that's a, she's really committed and really excited about our position and the future of indoor, or as Carrie identified as controlled environment agriculture. So one of the fun things about uh, Sensei Farms is we were started, you know, our first farm is on the night. So we, all of our products are grown with Aloha um, and we look to grow not just products, but, um, you know, people and partners. 
I think that's a really big um, part of our company is identifying that. The products are kind of the byproduct. You know, we, we're really excited about the growth of, of people uh, as, as well as products. So I wanted to share with you all um, Sensei's values because th these are the values uh, that we, we measure against every, every day and everything that we're doing. Um, and I think it will translate into showing you why we think we grow people uh, and develop people as much as developing um, food products. So um, our people are our most important asset um, and we wanna be stewards of our craft. So we take responsibility for corporate fiduciary land and process by which food grows and we do it with integrity. We wanna be transformational. Uh, we, we are pioneers for positive change in our industry through learning and collaborating, we will continue to grow. We wanna be rigorous. So we wanna engage the brain before taking action. We want, uh, we are accurate and thorough. We at Sensei wanna get things done. So we are accountable and trusted to complete tasks, to act responsibly and to open, uh, and open to receiving and providing direct feedback. So those, those are really critical values, but I think the last one is the most important one and it's to remember to enjoy the journey. So, you know, uh, we have fun, we're collaborative and we're aligned in our purpose and our mission and, and being aligned with, um, with your purpose and mission, make it really easy to make decisions that are in line with your business and, and your business's uh, cultural values. So I think it's really important that this is the foundation in which our company um, and all of our, our decisions are made. Um, what we do, uh, so, you know, we, we Sensei Ag deploys innovative, agile growing systems that address food related issues. Um, Sensei Ag will take the learnings of its pilot farm on Manai across the globe and bring hyper-local, nutrient-rich, affordable food to develop and emerging economies. Um, how, how do we do that, right? Well, we use modular growing systems. So Sensei Ag uses modular components to ensure product quality and consistency both uh, quickly and uh, efficiently. We use tailored technologies. So that means that we implement um, technologies and grow plants based on the environment that's best suited for the crop. Um, so for example, on Lanai, we have tremendous amounts of, of uh, great natural wind and solar. So we, we use those elements to our advantage. Uh, and to helping us in growing our plants in, in those environments. And then we also, um, you know, we want to grow through strategic expansion. So Sensei Ag significantly reduces the time needed to build a large scale indoor farm because we are modular and we can, you know, build a system based on the environmental conditions to, to be up and producing uh, much quicker than it would take to typically build out the entire infrastructure of an indoor farm. So some of our uh, initiatives um, and why we do what we do, um, Sensei Ag is more sustainable, more efficient, and more nourishing than other traditional farming practices. Um, and, and these are some of the reasons we, we identify as such. Um, as a hydroponic farm, we, we do use a lot less water than traditional agriculture. We are, we are not, um, we're not losing our water to evaporation. We're not, we're not watering the ground, right? We're delivering the water directly to the roots and preventing evaporation into the uh, environment. We can produce because of spacing and, and uh, how we grow through, through compact growing. Uh, we can produce a lot more product in the same square footage and the same footprint, right? Uh, we don't have to space our crops out like you would in traditional outdoor farming. And we take advantage of, of, of the system to, to do that. And then a key factor for nutritional value is the, the distance traveled. If we can reduce the distance traveled and the time it takes to cover that distance, um, we're dramatically improving the nutritional value of that product that's reaching the table. Um, and you know, it's, it's also rewarding and exciting to have harvest where you're you know, neighbors feeding uh, neighbors uh, sort of situation. So um, some of these numbers, you know, you know, we took some of our stats from the University of California, Davis. Um, but, but the idea is that by utilizing controlled environment, we, we can eliminate some of the, the, the pressures that make it difficult to produce um, agriculturally at scale in Hawaii and, and use the controlled environment settings to our advantage. So what does it mean? What are the benefits of, of um, 
hydroponic or controlled environment growing in, in Hawaii? And, and why does it matter? Um, well, to us, it means that there's an opportunity for the next generation of, of local farmers to be developed. And um, for us, we, we see that, um, you know, we can, we can provide improved working conditions. So, you know, we're creating technology that's focused on making the life of the farmer better, right? And, and that means like physically less demanding than, than previous field-based work. Um, you know, safety, reducing the exposure to, to the elements, chemicals, and harsh environments uh, by creating a controlled environment and, and keeping people's safety in mind uh, as they're doing their work. Um, we want to be able to develop a more attractive career path in which there's room for everyone, no matter the background, um, to, to teach computer science and biology and, and, and being relatable, um, repeatable, and easier, um, we, we open the job to, for more individuals, you know, in, in the hydroponic working environment. Um, in developing the next generation of local farmers, we also are excited about the opportunity for career advancement. So not, not just entering the work field, but um, the, the ag sector um, is, is expanding and growing. And, and we're providing internships this summer, hosted by the University of Hawaii students on Lanai. Um, we're creating career paths, which um, once, once you learn the skills, um, once you have this understanding of plant biology and how growing systems work, you know, you, you have a skill that you can take anywhere in the world. You know, you have this global skill that can be applied to anywhere. Um, and, you know, people are very forward thinking in Hawaii. So Hawaii is a great market to be, to be um, experimenting and adapting these technologies as, as people here are willing and trying to adapt with technology all the time. Um, the third section here is decreased reliance on imports, which is just um, incredibly important for us. Um, you know, locally grown food diminishes the need for mainland shipments and ensures availability of fresh food for the islands. Um, Hyperlocal foods contribute to word of mouth businesses as well as partnerships with major retailers throughout the state, which, which we've been able to do. Another thing that's pretty important about this is just the um, location. So. Lanai itself is very dependent on, on imported foods and they can only get a once a week barge service in from Young Brothers. And uh, just two weeks ago, that barge didn't make it into the port. So all of the food that was supposed to be brought into Lanai and distributed to the restaurants, hotels and, and um, households was, was, had to be rescheduled and rerouted. So by being able to produce our own food and, and provide it on Lanai, we're really increasing our resilience and food security on the island. So um, for us to be able to step in and tell everybody that we had food available and products available to fill the markets and, and, the, and the hotels was, is, is pretty exciting. So I want to touch a little bit about the fact that our form factor and technology are kind of agnostic. So in that sense, we're pretty flexible and we need to be flexible as technology and things are changing rapidly and the market changes pretty fast. Um, New things are coming on the market, you know, it seems like daily, but more likely weekly. Um, and so for us to stay kind of flexible and being able to adapt to the new technology is really important for us. Um, so in, in looking at some of these things, um, form factor, right? So we want to be able to leverage the best controlled environment, you know, um, growing technology. So uh, vertical farm, as Carrie mentioned, um, growing in a greenhouse or some combination of the two um, to reduce your inputs and produce the best products possible. Um, so we, we think it's important to be flexible in our form factor. Um, we think uh, active research and development is, is critical. So, you know, innovation and scientific teams are working to exploring, you know, novel growing methods to increase yields, minimize resources and maximize taste and nutrition. Um, you know, we want to be diverse in our locations, you know, we want to be locally grown, but globally minded, making indoor agricultural uh, affordable worldwide um, is, is one of our goals. And in the technology we use, we're unwed to a single process or system. So we want to use the most advanced tools available on the market. Um, and, and being agnostic to the technology allows us to do such and, and test and trial and deploy products that, that maybe other systems wouldn't be able to do or test with because their, their system is built on one type of technology. Um, I think a couple of things that are important to touch on here, um, while most, the most 
it's more cost effective. Um, it, it will be the bigger farms with the resources that will develop the algorithms and 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 um, help the smaller farmers eventually benefit from this research, right? So, you know, we have to work together. We, we have all different sizes and shapes of farms, but I think the idea that we wanna uh, encourage is the, is the sharing of that information. Um, Sensei, you know, we're, we're committed to a, to a lot of things, um, you know, and, and one of the things that we're most dedicated to is making a positive impact, right? For the community that we are operating and serve, as well as the world, right? Again, with that local focus and that global mindset. So Sensei Ag is committed to providing the highest quality innovations and products uh, in the agriculture industry. As part of our unique value system, we will develop and integrate technology to overcome the barriers in supply chain that negatively impact human health. We will solve for chronic costly um, health threatening challenges in farming, retail, consumer purchase decisions and world health concerns. So I wanna thank you for learning more about Sensei Ag today. And I look forward to taking uh, questions and, uh, and seeing what you guys all have to contribute. Thank you so much, Bruce, for that presentation. Fascinating. Um, and, and we'll have questions for you in a moment. A couple have come through in the chat. Uh, folks, just a reminder, if you have questions for any of our presenters, we will be going to a Q&A session, session afterwards moderated by board member Tam Hunt. So please make sure you're putting them in the chat as they come to you so you don't forget. Um, now it is my great pleasure to uh, welcome Nicole Lowen, Representative Lowen. The floor is yours. Uh, Aloha, thank you, Heather. And thanks so much for organizing this and to the um, great pre presentations and presenters that went before me. I don't have a, a PowerPoint. Um, and I think, I feel like my role here, I'm not an expert at all on um, vertical agriculture. My role here is more to provide the perspective of a policymaker and some of the things that we might think about. Um, so I know Heather introduced me earlier, but just really briefly, um, my name is Nicole Lowen. I'm a state representative for uh, the Hawaii House District 6, which includes Kailua Kona. I chair the Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection, and I'm also um, relatively recently became a member of the Committee on Agri Agriculture, so I've been learning more about that. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons that uh, the legislature and the, the population of Hawaii right now is really interested in discussions surrounding agriculture and, and alternative kinds of agriculture. Um, you know, that includes increasing resilience that, that's been brought up already. Um, you know, Hawaii imports anywhere from, we've heard numbers from 85 to 95% um, of our food supply. So in the event that we had a disaster that, that cut off um, harbors or airports, you know, that could be potentially an, an issue in actually having enough food for the people of Hawaii to consume. I think the, the statistics are something like we have a seven day supply um, and that's it. And, um, you know, to, to reduce reliance on imports, of course, and currently, you know, some other reasons are there's a lot of discussion around diversifying our economy away from tourism and about the agriculture sector being an, uh, a sector that really shows a lot of opportunity for expansion in Hawaii. And then um, also, of course, climate change, our imported food has a huge impact on the climate. Industrial farming has a huge impact on the, the climate. So insofar as we can do things differently by producing more locally and reduce our greenhouse gas you know, contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, then that fits into stated state policies as well. Um, so, you know, some of the, the upsides of that kind of covers, I think, what are some of the upsides of vertical agriculture for the island. And when this, um, when I was invited to participate in this webinar, some of the um, points that that brought up made me wonder if, if there was sort of this question, is vertical agriculture good for Hawaii or bad for Hawaii? And to me, I, I look at it as there's really um, there's really room for all different kinds of agriculture. I don't think that it's a choice between vertical agriculture and traditional agriculture, organic agriculture. I mean, there's there's so much room for expansion of how much food we produce locally, and um, you know, a lot of the way that vertical agriculture works would not be in direct competition with some of our um, more traditional farming uh, practices, not in competition with the land they use. Um, or anything like that. Uh, another, um, 
a possible advantage, I guess, you know, besides what I've already mentioned is that land use is a big issue in Hawaii, especially on Oahu. We already see um, some friction and competition um, about land use between um, renewable energy and agriculture, particularly on Oahu. And um, I think vertical agriculture, the idea of it provides an opportunity to incorporate agriculture into urban settings uh, that where we don't traditionally think of having agriculture. Um, and I guess some, some questions, I mean, you know, as a policymaker who doesn't know a lot about the technology, it's relatively new. I think it hasn't um, really been done like, you know, broadly, it's kind of a, the, the start of a new conversation. Um, you know, I think some of the questions we've had has been somewhat covered, but, you know, from our perspective, we probably want to dive in deeper. You know, what are the environmental impacts? How, how are the nutrients that might be released from it handled? Because we already have incredible pressure on our release from overload of nutrients. Um, you know, what is the profile of water use? which it sounds like is actually more efficient and what is the profile of energy use, which it sounds like it may be a heavy energy user. Um, and I guess that that leads to the question, I mean, all those things come, come with different costs. Someone mentioned the cost of just the, the having a building to do it in was really expensive. So, you know, in Hawaii, the cost of real estate is really expensive. The cost of electricity is really expensive. So those are two inputs that um, my, that, that a company looking to go into this would have to, to deal with. And I think there has been some discussion at the legislature. I believe in 2019, we passed a bill, um, you know, directing the PUC to consider or the, the um, utility to consider, I'd have to pull it up to get the exact, exact language, but to consider preferential rates for protected agriculture. So I believe there's currently an open docket at the Public Utilities Commission considering that. Um, so I think that's an interesting idea but then we have to keep in mind that any preferential rates would be basically ratepayer subsidized or any other kind of subsidy would be taxpayer subsidized. So we would wanna see you know, projects that can stand on their own from an efficiency and a, and a cost perspective. And that could be, you, know, you could incorporate considerations of the environmental impacts, the, the health impacts, uh, you know, all the, the, the job growth in the economy, those kind of impacts have some value too. So maybe that, what is produced by a kind of farming that has higher cost inputs on, on one level pay for themselves on another level. But those are all questions as policymakers we'd want to um, have answers to. Um, I think, you know, another question if you're looking at urban settings is what kind of impacts does it have on neighboring properties? Um, you know, is there bright lights at odd times of day? Is there uh, odor, pests? Is there issues with pest control and, and things like that um, are all questions that will come up that, that I'm curious about the answers to. Um, and then some other questions I would have, I think, as a policymaker are, uh, because a lot of the talk surrounding agriculture right now relates to economic diversification, those questions would be how many jobs would it provide? And would those jobs be able to be filled by local applicants? You know, would it, or would it be people imported from the mainland to come do those jobs? What kind of job skills would be um, required for those jobs so that if this is something that is growing in the future, we can think about uh, making sure that our students in you know, schools and community colleges and universities are getting the right training. Because if we're doing, you know, looking at this as an opportunity for economic diversification, we want those jobs to be available to uh, people graduating from school in Hawaii who were born and raised here, we want that to be an option for them as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, other questions would be, you know, the food safety questions, all the normal regulatory questions that come up. And then, um, you know, another big push is not just to produce food in Hawaii, but to produce food in Hawaii that will be consumed in Hawaii. And so that would be another, another question to what is the business plan for these businesses that are proposing to come in? Is it for local consumption um, or is, it, is this a business designed to export a product from Hawaii? Um, so I think I'll, I'll keep it brief and open to questions. And like I said, I'm not at all an expert. I've learned a ton um, just from listening to the prior presenters and um, just here to offer a little bit different perspective. So thank you for including me in this today. Thank you so much, um, Representative Lowen, again, for your time. 
Um, we will go now to our last speaker, Richard Ha. And um, Richard, I hope that you can, can tell that we are passing it to you now. Yeah. <laughs> we have some technical difficulties. All right. Can you hear? Yes, we can hear you, Richard. Oh, go perfect. ahead. OK, great. So I'm, I'm just going to wing it. Yeah. So um, I, the, the presenters pre, uh, previously covered all the things very well. So what I'm going to do is just give a, a brief history of who I am and uh, you know what, what I'm talking about and why, why anybody should pay attention. Um, <laughs> first of all, um, I flunked out of school and I got drafted to Vietnam. And then I was there for seven years. And then I thought, oh, I got to get out of the army because you can't uh, make, make your way without a college education. So I figured, okay, I better come back to school. So I went to UH Manoa and I decided I'd uh, major in accounting because I wanted to keep score. I, I didn't want to uh, uh, be in, in the, uh, <laughs> the profession. I, I just wanted to keep score. And, and what I'm going to try to share is the kind of stuff that I learned that would be valuable to people listening. Um, so, so, you know, when it comes to agriculture, we went all over the place. You know, we started at uh, uh, Kapoho in Bananas. Then we moved in closer to Hilo. And I, I'm speaking from the Big Island, yeah. So, um, and and we ended up on the east side of the Big Island where it rains a lot. So, so anyway, we, we moved from Kapoho where it's dry. We moved closer to Hilo uh, uh, at, at Shipment Land in Keaau. And then we moved to Tepe Keaua. And we were always, you know, in bananas. And the reason we chose to be a kale was because bananas need a lot of water, like a two and a half million gallons per year. So we look all over the place, considered all the possibilities, and we chose to be a kale because it rained, you know, three and a half million gallons of water a year. And it was free, and it was going to be free forever. So it was kind of a simple decision to make, yeah. So it was a lucky thing we did because we were still in KL when we moved to Tepikil. So we had two different farms going. Mm -hmm. Then we got hit with a virus. And, and, uh, and what we did was we shut that farm down, killed all the plants because we were surrounded by our friends, banana farmers. And we didn't want to have that be a burden on them. So we got rid of them. Then we moved to Tepikil. Then we were there for a while. And then the virus started moving across from Keao to Hilo, and then you could see it moving across, then you jump across Waduku River, then it started moving up the coast. And the problem was this virus was spread by a, um, it, 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 you, couldn't, you couldn't control it once you got into the valleys. That, that was the problem. Once we got into the valleys, it was stuck there and you couldn't do anything about it. So we started looking around, oh, oh okay. So we needed to uh, diversify. So bananas was a crop that was a small volume, uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, small margin, large volume crop. And we thought we, okay, let's, let's diversify into something else that had different characteristics. And the characteristics we were looking for is something that was uh, high, uh, and margin, but but you know, and, and that's why we went into tomatoes. But um, so we had to go figure out how, how we were going to do this. So I went to this control environment ag courses. This was like about holy shells, twenty years ago, um, in Tucson, Arizona, and I learned a lot about control environment ag, ag uh, um, over there. So we, we started to uh, experiment and, and, and uh, in the meantime, we went, the banana farmers took a trip to Taiwan. And when we went to Taiwan, we realized that the water table wasn't very high. You know, as a matter of fact, they, 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 they uh, uh, plowed the land and in, 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 uh, on the hills, the, the plants would grow, on the bottom was the uh, water table. And so that was interesting to know. But then, then we realized, you know, what, what you saw in the, in, in the, the videos, um, coconut water, what, what, so you drip the water in, but the way the thing works is the plants need a little bit, maybe two inches of air up on the top. 
and then the roots can go down. So that's what was happening in Taiwan, which we picked up. On, on the top of the hill was where the, the, the plants pick up the air. On the bottom was where they pick up the nutrients and stuff like that. So, so it was only that small little place that you needed um, the, the, the air. And so there were different ways of doing this. You know, like for example, you get a five gallon bucket and you fill it all up with water and leave a, leave a, a small air gap. And if you could plant your plants there, you wouldn't have to do anything. You wouldn't have to even pump water or anything because you had the air gap. All you needed was the, um, uh, uh, the nutrients and stuff like that. So, so just, just hold that in the back of your mind, you know? Then as, as we started to get into this, you know, and we started to figure out, okay, so we got to learn about this. Where, where can we go to, to see how to do this? So we went to England. And the reason we went to England is because England is dreary, like Hilo. So, so we figured, okay, so, so that's where we went. And what's really interesting, because when we went there, they had a different way of operating. They had uh, tunnels and uh, they held the, the, the plastic down with ropes. And the reason they did that is because if the uh, a wind came up unexpectedly, all you had to do is run out there with your knife and cut all the, all the, all the ropes. Then the plastic would fly. And then after the winds settle down, you go back and you, your infrastructure is still there. Yeah, so, um, and the reason I, 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 I wanted to talk at, at this uh, time was because my, my uh, you know, I realized that um, farming is tougher for farmers than it's ever been. When we first started, it was, I, I realized now they were relatively easy. And all you had to do was go, go figure out where you needed to be. Um, why, why is that? And, and the reason it's, it's getting tougher is because, you know, as the, uh, the world gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the, the, uh, it, it goes by volume. So the volume makes the, the margins go, get slimmer. And that makes it tougher for, for those, you know, people that live in Hawaii where we're only producing on a small scale. So now why that's scary is because we're at the end of the supply chain. Hawaii is like uh, the canary in the coal mine. We only have 15% of our, our, our food. So we got to figure out how, how we're going to do this. So now if we're talking specifically about the big island, where uh, several things come into play. One is we're not located in, in the city. You know where you can just grow your stuff, and then right there is where you start selling, right, right in the city. And they do that in New York. They do them up, up on the top of the buildings, and then they supply the restaurants and stuff like that. But here on the Big Island, we've got a lot of land, but a lot of distance. So first of all, you gotta collect it and and send it somewhere. If you send it to Oahu, then you then you sacrifice quality <clears throat> because on the barge. You know, especially if you have uh, uh, leafy vegetables and stuff like that, you put it on the barge, you lose so many days of, of, of uh, shelf life. So, so what, what, what do we do here on the Big Island? You know, there, there's several things. Um, uh, before I go any further, I wanted to say the biggest thing that helped me was when I went to uh, a UH to, to, to uh, uh, accounting school. In a cost accounting class, I ran across this concept. It was called break-even analysis. And that is absolutely the most important thing that I ever did. Because that break-even analysis, you can categorize your costs and manipulate it and plan. And so once, once I got that uh, knowledge, when I came back, I started running break-even analysis every week. So we, and break-even analysis is the cash flow analysis. Yeah. So we knew exactly where we were every single week. And so if we knew where we wanted to go, we knew how to maneuver this and that to get to the end. So we always had in our mind, what was the end, end, end goal? And my talking here, the end goal is to try to figure out here on the Big Island, how do we help farmers? And I, I've, I've been doing this uh, after I retired and, and, and I'm specifically doing this and it comes down to a simple thing. It's about energy and the first primary source of energy is food. And then, and then now we look at uh, oil, natural gas, uh, uh, fossil fuels. 
when we started to realize, holy smokes, there's a, there's a finite amount before we start going down the backside of supply curve. The question now is, how much time do we have? It's a really important question, how much time do we have? Because the folks that I find very credible having studied this for a long time now, is, is saying that in about 10 years, it, it's, it's gonna be really tough. And, and we've already passed the, 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 the peak of uh, world um, uh, fossil fuel supplies. So, so, okay, if that is the case, then what can we do? Well, you know, you, you saw there the people growing stuff uh, in, in uh, indoors. Uh, one thing we could do here on the Big Island is combine, you know, that, uh, uh, you don't have to be big, but figure out where your market is. Yeah, maybe it's a, 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 a farmer's market down the street with some, some, some uh, um, supermarkets. But how about combining that with tree crops? with um, academia nuts, with, with uh, cacao. Now all of a sudden you've, you've got a, 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 a more volume, but not only one product. Yeah. So, so just, just, uh, just saying, yeah. So, so what happened to us was we decided that we needed to either uh, um, grow our business uh, uh, or close the business because we already accomplished 20, 20 years of success. Now, if we were to go another 20 years, how much would that cost and, and could we pay it off? The answer was we could not. So we decided to, to close the farm. But, but it was okay to close the farm at that particular point because uh, but the economy was good, people could get jobs. It wasn't a problem. So, but then this, this what came up was some, some folks down the coast came by and asked me, hey, are you, would you be interested in doing uh, cannabis? And I said, well, would they tell me about it. And so they, they gave me the, 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 uh, what they had in mind. And I said, okay, what we got to do is first, we got to ask the workers if they, if uh, I, I'd like for our workers to get first shot at the jobs. And, and second of all, the, the, the people in the neighborhood had to feel safe. And third, I had to have a real job and not just be a cardboard caricature on a stick. And so they made me CEO. So I committed to four years. Um, at the end of the third year, they were doing fine. Everything was indoors, crops were growing beautifully. They're, 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 they're doing a super good job. And then I was able to retire. So now I'm sitting here doing what, I, what I, I, I really need to do, which is try to help smaller farmers and, and get ourselves as food secure as we possibly can. And Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm gonna so ask where do we go to, from there? Um, it, it comes back to energy. Um, so what kind of energy do we have here in Hawaii? We know we have wind, we know we have solar, but they're intermittent, yeah? Um, but, but the big deal is we have geothermal. And here's, here's the way to look at geothermal. It's gonna last 500,000 years to a million years we'll be sitting over the hotspot. And it, and it acts like a um, battery, except you don't have to charge it. And you don't have to, imagine this, if, if um, it, you know, and the whole, Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let, let me summarize by saying this. Whenever anybody sees geothermal coming up and we, we need support for geothermal, help geothermal, I'll get going because it'll help all of us. That, that's critically important. So the rest of the stuff is, is you know, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that's the, that's the, the big takeaway. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate it. And, and I apologize for the technical difficulties we're having with you today. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over the floor over to uh, our board member from Think Big, Tam Hunt, and he is going to moderate our Q&A section. Tam, all yeah, yours thanks, have some great questions. Great. Yeah, thank you. A bunch of questions. Let me start with um, this one for Blair or Carrie. 
beyond the reduction of transportation needs, what is the nutritional value of hydroponic greens versus traditionally grown greens? Shall I go? <laughs> go for it. Okay. Um, we haven't actually measured. I mean, we've uh, a lot of people have been asking because we do a lot of microgreens. So we know the baby greens are uh, definitely more nutrition packed uh, than the mature greens. Uh, the hydroponic greens, I think uh, on the whole, as we can tailor our nutrient um, mixtures for growing optimally, we can actually manipulate nutritional content. So in addition to transportation, not being having to move it very far, uh, we can actually work to optimize uh, what the, the final nutritional content is by changing the, the fertilizer or nutrients that we provide the plant. Thank yeah. you, Blair. Anything to add? Just speak to that, you know, um, there's also ways that we influence or what we would call stress the plant to produce uh, specific results that we're trying to get from the plant. So if we want, uh, let's say, more more oil from a basil or something, there's, there's things that we can do in the environment and the growing pattern of the plant to generate those results. Um, so yeah, using the environment and the nutritional um, and how we feed it and when we feed it and the, the, the the environmental controls definitely has an impact on the overall health of the plant, which has an impact on its nutritional, uh, its ability to retain nutritional value. Great, thank you. And a uh, question for both of you again. Could you speak to how you feel food safety certification will affect your operation and growth? <laughs> yes, food safety is not going away. So it's, uh, it's only getting more strict and more stringent. I think one of the benefits of the, the, the indoor vertical or hydroponic method is that, you know, we have to be super clean in our growing techniques because we're, because of our growing practices. And therefore our environment by itself is already uh, a very clean environment to be operating in. So when it comes to food safety and fo following those rules and those protocols, um, those are things that are kind of already incorporated into how our business operates because we're trying to make sure that we are you know, utilizing every component and aspect, right? So when we go to see, we want, we want, you know, 95% or higher germination rates, right? And, and we want those success, successful transplants in every movement of the plant. Um, and so I think those, those two um, factors are pretty important for us in, in uh, indoor ag. Keeping a really clean environment already, is already in line with keeping um, food safe. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, one of the advantages uh, we're actually I'm going through a food safety certification uh, course right now, and I saw Lisa and Francesca were on here, so I have to say something nice about uh, that, that process. Uh, but it is a lot of work, um, and the nice thing about vertical farming is, you know, one of the biggest things I see with the food safety is um, um, water quality, and that's a big issue. So where are you getting your water from? How is it transported? Uh, how are you keeping it safe? And you know, for vertical farms, um, we use municipal water. So we kind of got a big head start there. And then there are a lot of questions about are you keeping animals off the farm? And um, we have a pretty easy time of doing that. So I think a lot of things that are built into our systems that kind of keep us ahead of the game. Uh, the documentation part is definitely the biggest challenge for us. But again, you know, because we're indoors, we can kind of manage, okay, we know where this plant came from. Uh, it should be easier, I think, in the long run for vertical farms, indoor farms, to manage a lot of that information. Thank you. And Nicole or Richard, anything to add on that? Okay, great. Um, so next question, um, a couple of people asked about um, the same thing. And how do we... What, what do we need in terms of um, new incentives or you know, policy changes to ensure that small businesses can take part in this new technology and not get pushed out by larger companies necessarily? I guess as a small, smaller farmer, maybe I can address that. And uh, you know, I, I don't wanna sound flippant or anything, but I mean, the first thing that always pops in my head, if somebody gave me money, that would be the easiest <laughs> thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, but seriously, it, it definitely is a really uh, big barrier for entry, uh, especially for indoor vertical farming, just because of the capital expenditures. So, you know, I, yeah, I'm still addressing that. I, you know, I, I kind of bootstrap this thing with relatives and friends and family. 
uh, and we really you know haven't been able to expand it um, as much as I would like to just because it is hard to generate but you know what I'm doing now with these presentations and all kinds of other things is trying to just generate the interest to show the possibilities and hopefully you know get enough public policy uh, um, it, uh, backing and private equity backing or any kind of backing to show that you know we can contribute hopefully to um, more agriculture in Hawaii. Um, the policy things Nicole mentioned about the solar um, uh, uh, rates or the sorry uh, electrical rates. I'm actually the one that applied for it <laughs> as soon as I heard about it, and I'm still waiting. So you know it's uh, it's a long process. Uh, I understand the arguments. You know it's going to be subsidized by taxpayers. Um, but again, you know, I think there are ways to regulate that. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, make sure you're, it's for a business that's actually producing produce that will go into the local economy, uh, which we are. Um, you can put caps on it if you're worried about you know the cost of it. I think there's ways to regulate that to make it manageable. So I do understand the, the, the concerns. But again, I think you know, like many other industries that are new, um, there are going to be some kind of subsidies or backing initially to show that this is possible. And as the economy of scale grows and, and um, increases, uh, then hopefully these can stand on their own. Uh, I'll, I'll chime in. We actually, the Department of Ag does provide small scale grants to um, farmers and we actually increased it this year. I think it used to be 25,000. We increased it to 50 because of that, that number hadn't been updated since the 80s. And I'm actually not sure if that would apply to something like vertical farming or if there's some, something we could look at to see if that kind of grant funding that's available for small farmers applies to some of these like newer um, technologies for, for agriculture. Um, and then, yeah, as far as the electricity rates, I think, yeah, there has to be some kind of parameters on a cap or how long we allow it for, because I mean, it's not uh, taxpayer subsidized, but it would be ratepayer subsidized. So essentially, everyone who pays an electric bill would be helping to subsidize a lower cost for this kind of agriculture. And I think that ultimately, we want to help small farmers, we want to help local farmers, and we want to um, help incentivize innovation and new businesses. But then at the end of the day, over the long term, we want things to um, stand on their own and be a sustainable business model. Thank you, Blair. Anything to add or Richard? Okay. So actually a similar question for Nicole. Um, do we need legislative or policy changes to enable vertical ag to a high degree and or to protect consumers? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not, you know, especially I met the state legislature, not the county. And I would think that some of the hitches could be in, in just some of what, where you would place it if it's in a more urban area and, uh, you know, whether it's only allowed in industrial areas or um, like that would fall under like the county planning and zoning ordinances. So I'm not sure if there would need to be some kind of new legislation around that. Um, so yeah, it's something for me to look into. Thank you. And this may be kind of the million dollar question, but could Hawaii meet all of its imported food needs with vertical ag? And if so, how, how long would that take and kind of how many facilities would we be looking at? Uh, Tim, uh, uh, oh. See, can, I, can I say something? Over. Can you hear? Yeah, go ahead, Richard. Oh, okay. Yeah, so what I what I started to say was uh, try to get the uh, uh, the farmers to grow different stuff so that they can get more volume, because the way it is out on the outside island is we cannot get the volume. Uh, uh, unless we diversify. And, and the other thing is, if we wait long enough, we don't know how long that is, but if we wait long enough, we will have the advantage to the rest of the world because our cost of electricity from geothermal will not rise while the fossil fuel will, will no question about it, rise. So I, I, I just wanted to throw that out, yeah. I think it's going to be tough um, for just vertical farming. As I mentioned, there's a pretty limited crop selection right now. So, you know, uh, we could produce lots of leafy greens, but uh, you're not going to get tremendous amount of nutritional benefit from eating lettuce all the time. 
Um, but, uh, you know, again, there are the technologies there and as we try and explore new crops, uh, hopefully, you know, that can be addressed. But I think in Hawaii anyway, just the amount of space and land and electricity that you need uh, would make it pretty tough to do that economically. And I would just add that I think one of the interesting things that we have to continue to explore and look at is these different form factors, right? Um, there's a lot of different methods and different ways to try and protect, protect crop um, and grow crops together, right? So also trying to find those crops that grow in symbiotic relationships um, are really beneficial to trying to grow high density crops. You know, the, you can take, take the example of agroforestry, right? And, and how, how that food model works. Um, but, you know, by, by having everything not organized and in rows and kind of chaotic, the chaotic scene actually, you know, can be a benefit to fighting off pest disease and pressures like that. That's interesting. And um, maybe drilling down a bit further on that um, issue uh, for Carrie and Blair, if it is an economic issue that limits what kinds of crops could be grown, will that issue resolve itself over time? Or is it going to be an issue in perpetuity because of, for example, cheap agriculture from California or other places using traditional large volume techniques? I, I mean, I think that it's something that we have to look at. I, I would say crop, if we're dependent on crops from California, I would be nervous because California is, doesn't have water, right? It's, it, it's the desertification is happening every day, right? They're taking more water than is being replaced in the water table. Uh, and so to me, I, I can't look at that as a, as a real viable long-term solution and say, that's yeah, all right, we'll just keep pulling it from California because they can produce it with, you know, as a commodity crop for less. So I think that, you know, we, we have to look at, at it from a, of, of a, of the whole problem and not just treat um, symptoms of the problem. Great, yeah, so a few people have asked about um, carbon footprint and renewables. And I know um, both Carrie and Blair mentioned using renewables. What is the capacity to use renewables to really reduce their carbon footprint uh, compared to traditional um, techniques and particularly, like we just mentioned, imports from California, for example? Yeah, um, I, I've heard a lot of those statistics and I agree. I mean, I think right now, uh, it probably carbon footprint for us is gonna be higher uh, than a traditional farm it's because of the energy cost. So incorporating solar energy, um, we said getting sunlight into the operation uh, will all be ways that we can reduce that footprint. Uh, and the other thing I think we need to mention is that if, even though we have our carbon footprint, um, you know, we're not polluting as much and uh, we're getting safer produce. Uh, we're keeping the land from being degraded by agricultural practices. So there are benefits that don't always come into the carbon footprint equation uh, that need to be considered also. Yeah, that's a good point, Carrie. And, and I would say that, you know, um, depending on where we're farming, um, for Sensei, you know, we're farming on land that, you know, you wouldn't technically, you know, it's an old cattle ranch, right? So we're growing on top of land that was once pineapple and then cattle. So we've taken this land that may not be able to produce food, uh, you know, in a, in a regular um, traditional setting. And because we're growing it above ground in a hydroponic method, we're able to recapture that land and turn it into food producing um, land. And I think one of the other things, again, it's gonna depend on every farm and every farm setup. But one of the unique things about Sensei um, on Lanai is that we're using the natural environment um, like with as much sun as we can get and with the, with the, the winds as much as possible. And most of our growing systems, um, all of our growing systems are run off of all the pumps, all the screens, all the motors, all the fans are run off of um, a solar installation. Um, but again, that was, that's, cap that's possible due to a capital investment in the beginning to be able to run all of those. Great, and a question for Carrie again, um, for your 2000 square foot operation, could you share your energy consumption in terms of kilowatt hours on a daily or monthly basis? Uh, yeah, I saw that question come up, so I kind of ran it to my electricity bill and just to kind of do a quick calculation. So I'm estimating that, well, my, our HECO consumption is about 1500 kilowatts, kilowatt hours per month. That's pretty high. And then um, my solar output I was just checking for last month was 3,178. So 8,000 something altogether and about the, uh, was that two thirds from, not sorry, one third to 40% from our solar array. 
Great, thank you. Now looking at uh, workforce issues, um, obviously we'd like to see, uh, as Nicole mentioned, local hires. Do we have people who are trained already or is there a workforce development program for universities and colleges sufficient to meet the needs if we scale up on vertical lag in the coming years? That's a question for anyone. Well, I'll just say at Sensei, one of the things that we're really excited about is the community engagement and the community participation at Sensei Farms. You know, we, we've hired a lot of people from the community and continually look to, to find people within the community that are looking to, you know, do something different, right? Uh, doing something outside of the, you know, the hospitality industry. Um, and, and Sensei Farms on the night provides that opportunity. So we, we provide them training from day one, you know, before they're even allowed to go in the greenhouse, we, we put them through, um, you know, uh, a food safety training educational program and things like that. So really we, we're pretty committed within our community and we hope that we can continue to expand that into, this, into other counties in the state uh, to get people excited about agriculture and show them the diversity of jobs that are available within agriculture that, that they may kind of relate to old traditional practices or plantation style um, agricultural practices when we really want to show them that you know using the hydroponic method and you know if you came by our my uh, sensei farm or carrier's farm you would not see anybody bending over uh you know pulling anything out of the ground you know we're working on trays and tables and uh, things like that so just just getting people exposed to to what it is and, and the technology that's integrated into the systems i think is a is an exciting um, turning point in agriculture. And we should really look to get, you know, school programs and, and anybody excited and interested into participating with us. Great, now looking at um, one, oh, go ahead, Nicole, I see your hand raised. Oh, uh, sorry, sorry, I had a, a burning question, um, I guess maybe for, for Carrie or Blair. What's the profile of your energy use, like um, timing wise? Is it more at certain times of day? Um, well, it's when the lights are on. So the nice thing about vertical farming, uh, totally electric lighting, is we can turn the lights on anytime we want. So right now we have it on kind of a typical day cycle just because we're here, so we can look at the plants. Uh, but we can adjust that and move that to off hours. But um, uh, here on Oahu, the rates actually, the use is actually higher in the evening. So that's when we can turn the lights off. Um, we are about, I'd say, 50% lighting, 50% cooling. Uh, cooling, unfortunately, has to be on, you know, on all the time, so we can't really adjust that. But the lighting can be moved to whatever we want. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That answered it. <laughs> so um, maybe our last question here. Um, in terms of material inputs and sustainability, um, you mentioned uh, different kind of media used to grow crops. Now, are these things locally producible? Are they sustainable? Or are we trading kind of one issue for another if we're gonna really kind of ramp up vertical ag production? Uh, well, for us, um, our two main things are, um, we grow a lot aeroponically. So most of the roots are hanging in air and are being misted, but we do have a little rooting plug Unfortunately, nobody makes that here. It's made out of uh, coconut coir and peat moss. So it's actually compostable. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, uh, actually when we sell the lettuce, we sell it with the root plug on. So people could compost it. I don't think it's industrial compostable. So it'd be tough to do it at home, but it can be uh, in some ways used or composted if necessary. And then we also use a growing mat for our microgreens, which is also industrial compostable. So we were, we were really all co conscious of that decision, uh, you know, in selecting our materials. Unfortunately, not yet, none of these things are made here in Hawaii. So shipping those things here is, is pretty big burden. Uh, originally, like the original material for like hydroponic growing um, was what was a spun granite called rock wool. Um, that's kind of old technology now, um, and, and that's not very commonly used. I think some marijuana growers still use it because, because, um, because it's a good substrate, but all of our stuff is, again, is coconut core. So thank goodness to all those people that drink all that wonderful coconut water. Uh, as a byproduct, we get our, our planting material and our base for our plants. That's interesting. Thank you. So actually, last question here. Um, some LEDs are noisy, quote unquote, for ham radio users. Is that being considered at all in your production? 
Yeah, actually, I, I hadn't heard that. I assume any kind of lighting, I guess, gives off some kind of radiation. Um, it's If it's a time and or a distance equation, I don't know how much they would emit and how far they would emit. So I, I hope it doesn't affect anything. But again, as they get more efficient, uh, we have to use less LEDs. Um, so hopefully that, that will also reduce the emissions that come on with it. Great, well, thanks everyone so much. Um, Heather, back to you. Thank you everyone. And thank you, Tam, for facilitating that session. Um, and I just wanna say again, mahalo to all of our fabulous speakers tonight, Carrie, uh, Blair, Representative Lowen, and um, Mr. Ha, thank you so much for all of your uh, this great information about uh, vertical farming. I learned a lot today. I didn't know a lot about this subject, so it was fascinating. I appreciate you uh, helping us share this and begin the conversation with the wider public. And mahalo also to all of my fellow board members from Think Big for putting this together today. Uh, with that, we'll have everybody sign off. And again, have a great afternoon. And um, again, appreciate everybody being here. Ahui ho. Okay. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Okay.